Return to the Word is made possible by faithful supporters like you. Find out more at returntotheword.com. Welcome to another edition of Return to the Word Radio with Bible teacher Mark Fontecchio. Advancing the message of God's amazing grace through the teaching of God's Word. And now with today's message, here is our teacher. The Apostle John, the last living apostle, had been banished to the island of Patmos for his testimony for Jesus Christ. But now as we come to the second chapter of Revelation, we find that God had a specific message for the church at Ephesus. Would you join me this morning in Revelation chapter 2? Imagine, if you would, a young couple falling in love. There's an attraction. They have a desire to spend time together. And as a part of getting to know one another, this young couple begins to share. They begin to share things about themselves that few others would know. And it's at this point that the young man tells his significant other that because a family member had died and left him a trust fund, on the day that he gets married, he will be inheriting the type of wealth that means you would never need to work again. Well, this pretty young lady doesn't even bat an eye, promising that it doesn't matter to her, that it doesn't make a difference if he is rich or if he is poor because she just loves him for who he is. Isn't that what you want to hear? That's what you want to hear. Things progress for this couple. They set a date, but the day before the wedding, the young man finds out some devastating news. Because of a small technicality, the trust fund wasn't going to happen. And it's now doubtful that he would ever see a penny of that money. And instead of being able to provide a life without work, it was now going to be a much more difficult life. A life with a job. A life like the rest of us have, with paying bills. And the young man, feeling confident of her love, he rushed to tell his bride the night before the wedding, but instead of seeing unmitigated love in her eyes, he saw pain in her eyes, a sense of betrayal, a sense of hurt, and a sense of anger. So she walks away, telling him that she could never be married to such a common man. What type of love is this? Well, it's shallow and it's self-centered. But I want to ask you this this morning. How would you respond if you were the one supposed to inherit a trust fund, but then the love of your life walks out when you don't get the money? You would question their love, wouldn't you? You would question their love. You would tell them, you never loved me. You were using me. You loved me because I was going to get you a life that you couldn't otherwise have. You loved me because I, I was going to be able to take you places that no one else could take you. And somewhere in that conversation, you certainly would tell them, you did not love me for who I am. You were just using me. Now, the church of Jesus Christ, the bride of Christ, stands guilty of loving God for all the wrong reasons. Rather than just loving God for who he is, we love God for what he can do for us now because we want things on our terms. We want God to give us his kingdom now because after all, we are children of the king. We're heaven bound and a part of his kingdom and glory. But do we love God for who he is Learn about the God that we serve. Fall in love with his character. Fall in love with his goodness, his grace, mercy, peace, and his love. But don't be looking for an easy life. Some Christians find out that the trust fund isn't coming until Christ establishes his, his kingdom here on earth. And they are ready to walk away because they want a life now without death. And they want a life now without pain. They want an easy life here and now. And they have the pride and the selfishness to think that they deserve it. But that's not love. That's not love for the Savior. And sometimes the trials of life reveal the true nature of our faith. And we are confronted with the hard truth at that point that we are not serving God. We're using him. The context of Revelation 2 is that the church of Ephesus had a lot of good things going for them. 
It was a good church. They were known for their good deeds. They were known for their good doctrine. But their love for Jesus had come up short. The Lord was questioning the love of his bride. But there are many lessons here that God intends for us because chapter 2 and chapter 3 make up one of the most penetrating sections in the entire New Testament concerning the doctrine of the church of Jesus Christ. And many of the problems, I would say this, many of the problems that exist in the church today are because people are neglecting this section of the Word of God. They're neglecting the teaching that is found in these two chapters. Now first, we must remember that these are seven literal churches made up of Christians who faced their own problems. They had real lives and real problems. This is the primary lesson in these next two chapters. And as we go through these chapters, we will see over and over again that Christ demonstrates that he was very much aware of their circumstances, their strengths, their weaknesses. Christ clearly demonstrates that he and he alone is the head of his church. And the second lesson that we need to walk away with is that within these churches that existed, we see lessons that can be applied, absolutely applied to different churches as they go through some of the same problems that these early churches did. And what a great comfort that should be for the church of Jesus Christ, that any church that is going through one of the problems listed in these chapters can just simply open up the Bible, turn to this text, and see the solution from our Savior, see the solution from Jesus Christ himself for their problem. And the other lesson that we need to keep in mind as we go through this is that each of us, each person here, each person is responsible to take heed to the teachings of Jesus Christ, making sure that we take the lessons out of these chapters and apply them to our lives. And I say that because Christ himself points out the importance of this because seven times, seven times in these two chapters, Christ gives the message, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Are you listening to Jesus Christ this morning? The primary audience of Revelation 2 and 3 was the seven churches of the first century that this was written to. But the lessons, oh, the lessons are timeless. Now, the first of the seven churches addressed by Christ is what we're looking at this morning. And it is the church of Ephesus. And verse 1 tells us, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Today we hear a lot of different things on the news and social media. We hear things like America first, or maybe even Alaska first. Then it would have been Ephesus first. The people of Ephesus, they like to think of their city as the first city of Asia. This is a very Roman city in that day and a very pagan city. This is where you would land from a ship at the port of Ephesus if you were a Roman government official that was going east. This was a port town. It was a center for trading, but oh, it was also a very pagan town. Ephesus was home to one of the most prestigious temples in the pagan world. You know it as the Temple of Artemis, also known to the Romans as Diana. This temple... On this recreation, you can see it was about 425 feet long and 220 feet wide. And it was considered to be one of the seven wonders, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Each of its 120 columns was donated by a king. And we need to understand that the, the image of Artemis was one of the most sacred objects of worship in the ancient world. This was something that they worshipped often. But let me tell you this, this was immoral worship. It was centered in the lust of men. And the people of Ephesus considered their city to be a city of great importance to the rest of Asia. They kind of had a chip on their shoulder. Let's say it like that. They had a chip on their shoulder about their city. Ephesus was first, and it was the church of Christ in Ephesus that is addressed first. Now, Christ... He was addressing his bride, a group of believers that had left their first love. The church of Ephesus had fallen. 
And when any church, when any church begins to depart from Christ, it's because they've started to lose their first love. It's hard to believe that this church had fallen so quickly. I'd like you to consider the history of the church of Ephesus. This was the church that was first started by the preaching of the Apostle Paul during the years of 52 to 55 AD, roughly 40 years before the time of Revelation being recorded by John. When the riot of the silversmiths forced the Apostle Paul to flee the city, the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ had such an impact that it had even affected the worship of Artemis, of Diana. But think of that great impact in that day of the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Because Acts 19 verse 10 says this. It says, And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greek. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ was going forth all throughout Asia. And Paul had such a close relationship with this church that he spent more time in Ephesus on his missionary journeys than anywhere else. And when Paul was under house arrest in Rome, as he wrote to the Ephesians, it becomes clear that men had already crept into the church back then with that deceptive doctrine. And then after Paul was released, we think Paul went there with Timothy And from Paul's first letter to Timothy, we walk away with the understanding that Timothy was left in Ephesus to continue the work of ministry. And after Paul and Timothy, church history teaches us that the Apostle John made Ephesus his home somewhere around 66 AD until he was exiled to Patmos. See, the records teach us that John was released and when he was, he returned to Ephesus, staying there until he died. This church, I want you to understand this point, this church held such prominence that as many as eight books of the New Testament were possibly first sent to Ephesus, including the Gospel of John, Ephesians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, 1st, 2nd and 3rd John, and of course the book of Revelation. And Paul was serving and ministering in Ephesus as he wrote 1 Corinthians This church had men like Paul, Timothy, and John teaching them. But even though they had these great, great men of God teaching them, what do we still find just a few decades later? We find Jesus Christ correcting them, which is a warning to the body of Christ that we absolutely, absolutely cannot rest on the teaching ministry of those men who have gone before because we each are responsible to carry the mantle, to continue in the faith, and to pass on the teaching of the Word of God to the next generation. But that means you got to learn it for yourself. Take another look at verse 1. Let's read it again. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Angels, these were human messengers, sent to each of these seven churches. And verse 1 is addressed to this messenger that would be sent to the Christians at Ephesus. It was a message for the entire church. But notice what the rest of verse 1 teaches us. The same living Savior who was seen in chapter 1 as standing in the midst of the lampstands, in the midst of his churches with the seven stars in his right hand. He has a specific message for the church at Ephesus. Where John testifies in verse 1, these things says he, this was a Greek expression. This was a way to introduce the words of someone in authority, someone who was a king. And in this case, what is John saying? John is testifying that Jesus Christ, the king of kings, is speaking to his church with all authority and with all deity. Now, as we look at these seven churches, understand that in each of these different messages to the churches, Christ calls attention to one aspect of who he is that becomes important when Christ addresses the weakness of that particular church. Let me show you what I mean when I say that. Down in verse 8 to the church in Smyrna and down in verse 12 to the church at Pergamos, we don't see Christ mentioning that he was standing in the midst of the lampstands. Or we don't see that he was holding on to the stars in his right hand. But we see it mentioned here for the church of Ephesus. Because this was the church out of those seven that needed to understand that they were in danger of having their lampstand removed. 
This group of believers needed to know and understand that Christ was in complete control of his church and his loving care for his church demanded his critical judgment of their condition. The idea given is of Christ making sure that the lampstands of these churches were shining like they should have been. It should remind us of something that we see in the Old Testament of the priests tending to the lamps of the holy place of the tabernacle, keeping the lamps trimmed, oiled, and burning, giving us the image here, though, of the constant care of Jesus Christ for his church. And then look at verses 2 and 3. Here comes the message from Christ. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. I've told some of you this, this story before, but it's a little bit, Revelation 2 is a little bit like the old story of the couple driving home from church, and the wife was sitting on the far right side in the pickup truck, and she noticed that over the years they had been drifting apart as they drove, and she looked at her husband and said, Honey, do you remember when we first met? How close we used to sit together. You used to put your arm around me. What happened to those days? And with one hand on the steering wheel and his other arm resting on the empty seat between them, the husband just says, I have not moved. The distance was not because he had moved. His place had remained constant. She had moved away from him. And that's what we see in the church of Jesus Christ, both then and today. The church at Ephesus was about to be told that they were the ones that had drifted. Christ hadn't drifted. Christ hadn't changed who he was. Christ had not yet removed their lampstand, their testimony for Jesus Christ. It says he was still standing in their midst. So Jesus begins to, in verse 2, he begins to address the church with the words of commendation. And he says, I know. And it's not just, I know, like, I kind of know. It means, I know with full and complete sovereign knowledge, Christ is fully aware of what is taking place then and now in each of his churches. Christ knows the attitudes of the hearts of his people. He knows how each of us are living out our faith, not just on Sunday mornings, but every single day. Don't you dare think that Christ doesn't know what we do here. And don't you dare think that Christ doesn't know what you do in your life or what it is that you're going through when you struggle with problems. Christ knew their works. Christ knew how they were living out their faith. The Lord knew every aspect of their faith. He knew their labor. He knew the work they were doing for Christ. He knew their patience. Notice that word. That is a word that is used in the New Testament for the character that comes by facing the trials of life. When this word for patience was used by the Greeks, it was used to refer to the character of a man who faces up to something that came into his life uninvited. A problem, a trial, a struggle. In that day, it would be the sting of grief or the shock of battle and war or facing your own death. For the redeemed, this refers, hear me, to the believer's acceptance of the will of God in your life when you go through those tough times. See, the church at Ephesus, they lived out their faith. They accepted the will of God in their life. And this church, I commend them because they would not tolerate the corrupt teachings and doctrine of men creeping into the church. This was not a lazy church. This was a church that knew the word of God. They contended for the faith. Christ was commending them that they could not bear those who are evil. Notice the word bear there that they could not bear with them. The idea of the word is that of something being a burden. You see, Christ was commending them because they refused to bear the burden of evil men. The meaning is that they had an evil influence. The church would not accept men that were an evil influence in the church. 
This word was used often in the first century to refer to a soldier who was a coward, who ran away during battle, or a student who was lazy and wasn't doing his schoolwork. In either case, they were in danger because they could influence the other soldiers in the army. They could influence the other students. And that's the exact danger that Christ is warning about when churches today openly accept those that have an evil influence. And I think that is so, so common in the Western church. Notice the specific problem. And you have tested those who say, we wouldn't even test in the Western church today. We wouldn't test any doctrine because that's how weak the church has become. And he says, you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them to be what? Nice people? No, he says liars. This was a dangerous situation for the church. This was a problem for the early church already during the time of the Apostle Paul as he wrote to the church of Corinth. Listen to 2 Corinthians 11. It says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ, and no wonder, strong words coming, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. See, Paul was saying these false apostles were on the side of Satan. They followed the same pattern as that of Satan, claiming to be somebody that they weren't. So it should not surprise us that at the end of the first century, as Christ was speaking to John, that men who were rising up who had claimed apostolic authority, men claiming to be apostles had shown up at the church of Ephesus. To be an apostle means that you speak on behalf of Christ that you come speaking with the authority of Christ. But they had tested these men. They had tested their doctrine. And they found out it wasn't pure. So then Christ tells the church, and you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Notice this list. The men and women of this church persevered. They had patience. They labored. And why? It says, for my name's sake. The churches were suffering persecutions terrible at the hands of the Roman Empire. False apostles were trying to come into the church, and this church persevered through all that was going on. All of this was done for the name of Christ because this is where the church found their strength. But the tone changes now, doesn't it, in verses 4 and 5. It shifts dramatically. Let's read it. It says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now, as we noticed, the church at Ephesus had done a lot of things right, but Christ took issue because they left their first love. So here's a very important fundamental question if we're going to understand what our Savior wants us to understand. What does this possibly mean that the church had left their first love? When Paul wrote the letter of Ephesians to the church roughly 30 years or so before this, Paul prayed that they might have more love. Listen to his prayer from Ephesians 3. He says that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the knowledge of Christ which passes knowledge. It has been said that for the church of Ephesus in the days of John, the furnace was still there, but the fire had gone out. There was still a measure of warmth But the coals, the coals in the fire no longer had a bright glow. The coals of the fire were now a dying glow. Their passion for Jesus Christ had cooled. And when the first Christians at Ephesus responded to the gospel, they had an indescribable passion and love for the Lord Jesus Christ. They had done so well, so good at upholding the doctrines of Christ, but their passion, their love for Christ had dimmed. Now, every believer in Jesus Christ, every redeemed child of God has experienced already the love of God because of the presence of the Holy Spirit of God given to us at conversion. Romans 5, 5 teaches us because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. But when that first love for Christ begins to fade in a church, all that is left is a facade. All that is left is formality as churches go through the motions and there's no reality. 
And the wording here conveys the teaching that not only had they left the emotion of love for Christ, but more importantly, they had left, they had forsaken the person of Christ. You see, this is not just saying here that the church needed to focus on brotherly love. He is not speaking about love in general. He says specifically, you have left your first love. What is the first love of a Christian? The first love of a Christian, the first love of the church has to be our love for the Lord. Isn't that what we read in Mark 12 where Christ said, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. See, when Christ speaks of our first love, he must be talking about our love for God. And a lot of times today, you hear this text all messed up when people preach on it. They like to say that you just have to get excited and recapture that excitement you had when you first became a Christian. I think the text is speaking to something deeper, something more. In a healthy marriage, love deepens over time. It matures. The earliest love in any relationship is rarely the best love. Christ is not saying recapture the excitement that you once had for me. He says, you have left your first love. The church is the bride of Christ, and her first love is the bridegroom. And so when Christ says, you have forsaken your first love, he's saying, you have forsaken me. You have forsaken me. To forsake your first love means you have forsaken Christ in the busyness of your life. See, Christ is no longer front and center of who you are and what you are about. Your life has become about something else. And Christ is telling his church, your ministry is doing great. Maybe you even have programs. Your ministry is thriving. Your statement of faith is sound. Your commitment to hard work is incredible. You're serving. You're discerning. You're persevering. But you are no longer a Christ-centered church. And unless you recenter your ministry on me, the living Christ, then your light, your lampstand is going to go out. See, it's possible to serve with a great passion and no longer be about Jesus Christ. I hope this has not happened to you. Have you lost your first love? How does this happen? Christ says nothing to suggest here a pattern of sin or some big hidden scandal in the church. See, sometimes life gets full and the person you love so much gets taken for granted. And so what do you do, Christian? How can we make sure that our lives are about Jesus Christ and that our love for him doesn't become about ourselves, us using him? Christ gives us the answer in verse 5. First, Christ says, remember from where you have fallen. Remember when you had a deeper fellowship with Jesus Christ. Let me ask this question. Was there a time when you, when you loved Christ more than you love him right now? And if you're not sure how to measure yourself with the height of love for Jesus Christ that we should have, here it is. 1 Peter 1.8 teaches us, speaking of Christ, and though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice. Do you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory? Has the height of your Christian faith ever had this type of love for Jesus Christ. Maybe there is more for you to discover in the Christian faith. Maybe there's more for you to discover as a Christian in the Word of God. The greatest danger is to become unaware of our position and then become comfortable in those shallows of life. See, Christ calls for his church to repent, to repent of their cold heart towards him and return to the first works for him. The church at Ephesus need to understand how desperate their condition was. They had fallen. They needed to repent. And this church need to think back to the first love that they had with Jesus Christ. The first works are simply the same kind of works that flowed from their first love for Christ. And love that is centered on Jesus Christ is love that produces action, that honors Christ. 
If they did not repent, if they did not return to Christ as their first love, the only other option would be that Christ would come to remove their lampstand. You see, what Jesus is saying to this church, and these are strong words, aren't they? Jesus is saying, if the church failed to act, Christ would come. Christ would act as judge, and he would come quickly to remove their lampstand. And in the wording, there is actually a focus here on imminence, meaning that it is described in the original language like this, as if Christ was already on the way to take action. See, Christ is saying to the church, either you get your stuff together, either you act, or I will. And if Christ would act, it would be the end of this local church. Why? Because if there is no real love for Jesus Christ, then there is no reason for the church to exist. Verse 6 in your text. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Something that is lost on the church today is that Christ is holy. Christ is very holy. He is holy and he hates sin. And if we're going to follow in the footsteps of the Savior, it means we must learn to hate the teaching that distorts the purity of the biblical truth. See, Christ was letting them know that there was still hope for this church because the love they did have for Christ showed itself, revealed itself in the hatred of the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now, you can read endless commentaries on who these people were. There's different theories, and we don't need to get into that. We need to know that the Nicolaitans basically were a heretical group. That we know. And the church was correct for rejecting their teaching. And this we also know. There's a wonderful promise, and we've been building to this. Look in verse 7 with me. There's a wonderful promise to the church in verse 7. Here we go. It says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. He who has an ear, let him hear. This is being attentive to the truth. This is obedience to the truth proclaimed. Christ was looking for a response. Christ was looking for obedience. Christ was speaking, and the Holy Spirit of God was using John to write this message down. And the message to the believer is this. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The book of Revelation, I hope you see this, the book of Revelation is a message for the church today. But who is meant by the overcomer? Well, notice with me the rest of the verse. Those who overcome will eat of the tree of life. You may want to jot down Revelation 22, verse 2, where we have a better description of the tree of life. Because there the tree of life is in the new Jerusalem. And those that eat of the tree of life are those who enjoy eternal life. They are, in my opinion, one and the same. Meaning, those who overcome are the redeemed, the regenerated in Christ. In fact, all that is promised to the overcomer in Revelation 2 and 3 is in all of these seven messages to the seven churches. The last three chapters of Revelation go into detail of what this future will be for the redeemed. Watch this wording. To him who overcomes. John used that expression, that phrase, 23 times in his writings. And overcoming, as used by John, is pretty much the same as that of believing. Listen to 1 John 5, verses 4 and 5, where it says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Or listen to Revelation 21, verses 7 and 8, where it says, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is... What? The second death. The one who overcomes is the redeemed child of God. The one with faith, they believe, therefore they have overcome. And what are we going to see in chapters 2 and 3? We are going to see is that the circumstances and the conflicts that exist in each of these churches are different, but those who believe will overcome. 
In the first promise, it speaks of the tree of life and should remind us of the very first book of the Bible, right? It should remind us of the book of Genesis and the Garden of Eden. You see, the sin of man meant that we could no longer enjoy the tree of life. Genesis 3 records that we would live in our sinful state forever if we would have continued to eat from that tree. It is out of God's grace, it is out of his love that God shut mankind out of the garden. But notice what Christ proclaims. He says, I will give. This is the promise of Christ to all believe. We have life now, and the full completion of this will come in the future. Revelation 22, verse 14 says, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to eat the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Now, the fact that we can look forward to this day when we will partake of the tree of life is pointed out by Christ himself as he declares back in our text that the tree of life is in the midst of the paradise of God. With all the parallels between Genesis and Revelation, it is very fitting that the wording used for paradise carries with it the idea of a garden. In Genesis, the tree of life was in the Garden of Eden. And in Revelation, the tree of life is in paradise. It is in paradise that eternal life is to be enjoyed in all its fullness. This will be where the saints of God, the believers in Christ, enjoy the very presence of God and the complete fullness of eternal life with him. You know, the overcomer is not told to prepare themselves for the dreaded woes of the tribulation on earth because the church isn't going to be here. But instead, the church is told to look forward to the tree of life and our future with Jesus Christ. As I was working on this message this past week, I was thinking and reminding myself about an old couple, an old couple who wanted to get married. Now, Chuck was 81 years old, and Florence was 80 years old, when they came to their pastor and approached him about premarital counseling. They had first met back in 1934. They had become high school sweethearts, dating all throughout high school. Everyone could see that they were made for each other. And so no one was surprised when they announced their engagement the very day after graduation. As Chuck put it, she was the light of my life. But Chuck got busy with life and a promising career. He had a great job offer in another state and had to choose, make a decision. Well, should he go or should he stay? He loved Florence, but it was an offer of a lifetime. So he took the job and he, he kept in touch. He came home once a month for the first six months and wrote letters almost every single day for a long time. Then the visits became less frequent. The letters came less often and his career took more and more of his time. Eventually, the letters stopped, and Florence's last letter to Chuck came back marked, moved, no forwarding address. And over the next 50 years, Chuck had an amazing career. He was promised many things in his career, and then he was promoted often. He made a ton of money. He was married several times, and eventually... He lost everything through those failed marriages. He lost his money. He lost his health. He even lost his self-respect. At 81 years old, Chuck ended up living alone in a little mobile home park. Now Florence, Florence never did marry. She retired from teaching school and moved to Southwest Florida where she also lived alone in a little mobile home trailer park. But in the providence of God, they met again to, at a missions dinner many, many years later. And as Chuck put it, they fell in love all over again. Now, Florence never did stop loving Chuck. And so on December the 3rd of 1997, Chuck and Florence walked down the aisle of the church. And as the pipe organ played, here comes the bride. And standing at the altar, Chuck said these vows, Florence, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I didn't do this 60 years ago. My selfishness has caused us both a lot of heartache, and I have missed out on the one thing that really, really mattered. You. You have always had a piece of my heart, and today I want to give you all of my heart. Never again will I forget how much you love me 
or how much I love you. Chuck died just two years later, and his greatest regret in life was forgetting how much Florence loved him and how much he loved her. Church, the church at Ephesus was certainly busy doing a lot of things, good things, but they had forgotten the most important thing. They had forgotten their first love. And so the church was dying. We see dying churches like this all the time. They had lost their identity and were in danger of losing their witness for Christ in Ephesus. And there's a lot of Christians, too many Christians, living like this today. And there's a lot of churches like this. These churches, every year, they grow colder and they grow smaller until they just pitter out and they die out, leaving behind big empty buildings and a bridegroom waiting for his bride to be faithful to him. So how can you tell if you're losing your first love? Let me ask you some questions. Does your mind switch to autopilot when you come to church to worship? Do you remember your last answered prayer? Do you read your Bible because you want to or because you're supposed to? Do you feel guilty when others talk about how much they have enjoyed and learned from the Word of God? Do you go to church because that's what you've always done? Or do you actually really want to be here? Are you looking for ways to become less involved or looking for ways to be more involved in the body of Christ? See, Jesus invites us back to that place of trust, that place of faith, and that love for him. The marriage of the Lamb is coming, and I, for one, I, for one, want to be found faithful to him. That's the reason I'm here. First love is that which loves without reservation. First love in the eyes of God is the love that first brought you to God. It's the love you witnessed when you first saw the cross for what it really is. It was when you realized the blood of Christ was shed for your sins by his overwhelming love for you. It's the love that you first had for Jesus in response to his great love for you. First love is a very powerful thing, isn't it? But we need to protect it because one of the greatest threats, one of the greatest threats is complacency. So Christian, if you have wandered, return to the Lord Jesus Christ and hold, hold fast to that first love for him. Continue to grow in the word and in his grace and look to that glorious day when we can eat of the tree of life, dwelling for all eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Return to the Word Ministries is committed to teaching the full counsel of God's Word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. For more about our ministry, please visit returntotheword.com. Return to the Word is a faith ministry. This means we freely distribute the teaching of the Word of God over the air and online. We do this without charge. If you feel led to support the ministry with a donation to help cover these costs, you may do so on our website, returntotheword.com, or by mailing a donation to Return to the Word, P.O. Box 879-259, Wasilla, Alaska, 99687. Thanks for listening. And we pray that the Word of God will be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Join us next time for another edition of Return to the Word.